And welcome back to the Wellness Paradox podcast. I'm so grateful that you can join us on this journey towards greater human flourishing. As always, I'm your host, Michael Stack, an exercise physiologist by training and a health entrepreneur and a health educator by trade. And I'm fascinated by a phenomena I call the wellness paradox. This paradox, as I view it, is the trust, interaction, and communication gap that exists between fitness professionals and our medical community. This podcast is all about closing off that gap by disseminating the latest, most evidence-based, and most engaging information in the health sciences. And in episode 65, we're going to have a slightly different conversation. Uh, This comes off the heels of episode uh, 62, where I provided some bonus content from Ursa this past year in Miami Beach. And I received some emails and some DMs regarding a number of different things from that conversation. So today is a a bit of a follow-up on that discussion. It's also to point out a significant bright spot in advocacy and lobbying that happened here in the state of Michigan, where I'm based. Uh, But as I started to get these messages that rolled in after the URSA follow-up content, it really got me to realize the importance of having just a, a conversation with all of you, our listeners, around the importance of advocacy for our industry with state, local, and federal government. And it just caused me to realize that until I was educated and enlightened on this topic, I I was very much in the dark. And so I thought I would take this opportunity, given episode 62, the recap of Versa, and given this very exciting news that happened here in Michigan, to talk a little bit about the value of lobbying and the value of advocacy, uh, what it means, what it doesn't mean, and how you could get involved to whatever level of comfort that you may have. So this is not going to be an interview-based conversation. Uh, This also probably is not going to be a very, very long conversation. I'm not looking to get us into the weeds here on politics and lobbying and advocacy, but I do think it's important for me to provide my perspective over the past couple of years as to the, the role that advocacy has played in getting our industry to where it is at today. And then I think more importantly, and I think this will be the very poignant part of the discussion for all of you, the critical role that advocacy and lobbying will play in getting us to where we want to go in the future on the healthcare continuum. So for starters, I I think it's great to start with a bright spot and some exciting news. So I'll I'll just start with that, which probably was the, the true catalyst that caused me to want to have this conversation with all of you. And that's that here in the state of Michigan, uh, myself and other members of the Michigan Fitness Club Association, which is our state alliance for health and fitness clubs in Michigan, uh, have secured eight and a half million dollars in the form of a grant, uh, dedicated state aid that was appropriated in the budget for the state of Michigan. Budget was just recently passed here uh, at the end of June. And this is a significant win, not just for us here in the state of Michigan and for my fellow MFCA colleagues, but also around the country. Now, unfortunately, we're the only state in the entire nation at this point that has gotten dedicated aid. As some of you may be aware, uh, there was the GYMS Act on the federal level that went through several iterations and at the end failed to get the bipartisan support it needed to be part of a larger bill that would have appropriated direct money to the fitness industry federally. At the state level, we had been working separately, and I'm well aware there are other ongoing conversations in other states about similar aid, but we were the first state to get this across the finish line. And my hope is, is this provides a little bit of a template as well as some inspiration for our colleagues in other states to work with their lawmakers to make this a reality. Now, what you should know about this, and this will kind of build the bridge to our larger discussion today, what you should know about this is that we originally asked for $53 million, which I know sounds like a very, very large sum of money uh, when you put it into an individual business context. But when you're talking about supporting an entire industry uh, that was decimated by a pandemic where it was closed for six months and over one third of its clubs were closed permanently, uh, 
$53 million is kind of a drop in the bucket by governmental aid standards. Uh, I won't recite all of the comparable aid packages for the restaurant industry and theaters and airlines. That information is available online. You could look at that. And when you do look at that, you will see that you know, $53 million, although seemingly a large sum to an individual, to an industry is relatively small. We asked for $53 million and uh, we knew that that was an uphill battle. The industry had never gotten dedicated aid for anything at any point in time. Ultimately, the number that was settled on was eight and a half million, a much more modest number. And that number in and of itself is probably not going to be too terribly impactful on the financial future of the industry here in the state of Michigan. Ultimately, the clubs that needed that money the most have already closed. The clubs that are still here are trying to recoup losses and trying to get back to a point of stability. It will have an impact, but it will be a marginal impact. Uh, certainly the higher dollar figure would have had a more significant impact and definitely a dollar figure earlier would have had a more significant impact than any dollar figure later on in this process. So the actual monetary part of this is somewhat insignificant relative to the larger overarching message that this line item in the state budget generates. And it begins to build the narrative of legitimacy of our industry. And I think really that's what this whole COVID period has been about. And coming out of COVID has really catalyzed and invigorated this movement towards legitimization and professionalization of our industry and the professionals that work within the industry. And that is where I think this is incredibly powerful. And it's probably worth far more than eight and a half million dollars. Uh, this narrative of the legitimacy and the professionalism in our industry that's commensurate with getting this kind of aid, in all honesty, is probably worth more than the $53 million we were asking for originally. And so I think that that's the jumping off point for this conversation that I'd like to have with all of you about the importance of advocacy. And when you talk about advocacy, you're really talking about advocating for the good of your industry or your endeavor at a level that comports with and is consistent with the, the good of the public. And I want to unpack that a little bit more because if you're just advocating for your own self-interest, I don't think that's a very strong position to advocate from. If you're advocating for the betterment of your profession in a way that also betters public health and population health, like we are doing as an industry, then you have a much more robust platform and narrative to be able to advocate from. And that's a lot of the work I think that we did here in the state of Michigan that was instrumental. It was not simply a conversation around us saying, hey, we were financially damaged by COVID. We were shut down for six months. This is really difficult on us and we deserve money because it was difficult on us. Certainly a lot of those things are true, but at the same time, we also said, and health and fitness centers and fitness professionals are critical aspects to our public health infrastructure in the state of Michigan. Therefore, this is money that can go towards rebuilding part of that public health infrastructure. And it's it's very interesting because if you would have told me in January of 2020 that here in July of 2022, I'd be sitting here having a conversation with all of you, our audience, on advocacy and lobbying, which is two subsets of the political ecosystem, I probably would have said, you're crazy. I probably would have said, ah, I don't, I don't do politics. Politics is too political or whatever word I would have used. And I think probably a lot of you that are listening right now, particularly maybe some of you that aren't uh, facility owners or operators, maybe you're just individual fitness professionals, you're thinking, Mike, I don't want to have anything to do with politics or anything to do with lobbying. It just it just seems like a mess and it seems like you you can't make a difference. And again, I think sitting in your shoes in the beginning of 2020, I would have said exactly the same thing. But 
now I've seen since you know, May of 2020 when the MFCA formed and as we've progressively done more and more work in the lobbying and advocacy space, I've seen the tangible impact that it can make. And I've seen that you actually can make a difference. You can move the needle. And I think that's why this was the right time for this conversation, because you know the MFCA and, and many other people like us in other states and even at the federal level have been working so hard to push legislation across the finish line that supports our industry, but we haven't got it there yet. And it's challenging when you don't have that tangible reinforcement of your efforts uh, to really want to sing it from the mountaintops in terms of all the hard work you're doing because it hasn't produced anything yet. Uh, now we've produced something. And, and I do think this greases the skids towards aid in other states. And so what I want to say to all of you with regard to advocacy is I know that this might seem like a, a bigger mountain to climb than what a is worth it or B you're capable of, uh, that is not the case whatsoever. And, and so let's talk about how we operationalize advocacy and lobbying for the interests of the professionalism that exists in our industry. And I think the the first thing to talk about is is certainly you know getting aid like we got during COVID for COVID, I should say, is, is important. No doubt about it for the financial harm and injury and the stability of the industry here in the state of Michigan and then hopefully in other states to come. But more than anything else, if we are looking to move on to the healthcare continuum, which that is the fundamental premise of this podcast, that is the wellness paradox, the, the gap that exists between fitness professionals and medical community. And one of the levers to 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 pull to close off that gap is the lever of advocacy and lobbying. And again, to go back to my point earlier, I would have told you in January 2020 that, man, I have no interest in being involved in politics. And then I've came to realize two really important statements during this period of time. And uh, I've, they've been attributed to many people, most memorably the person that comes to my mind uh, right now is Liz Clark, who is the new CEO of URSA, brought in post-pandemic with a very strong lobbying effort, or a lobbying background, I should say, based in Washington, D.C. And I've heard her say two things. I've heard other people say these as well. First off, if you are in business, you are in politics. Secondly, if you are not at the table, you are on the menu. And those statements ring so true for me, and I believe they'll ring so true for so many of you, because the reality was we didn't have a seat at the table at the beginning of the pandemic. That seat didn't exist. We weren't even in the room. Heck, I don't think we were in the building or even the parking lot at that point in time. And we did end up on the menu because we thought the business we were in wasn't a business that was associated with politics. And we were dead wrong. And it cost us significantly. In fact, as you look at a lot of the national statistics on what's happened in the industry post-COVID is we've certainly lost on a permanent basis more than 30% of our health and fitness clubs around the country because we didn't have the relationships with lawmakers at the local, state, and federal level. We didn't have that seat at the table, the voice in the room. And because of that, uh, not only were we behind the eight ball coming into the pandemic, but we were so far behind that we really couldn't make up ground until after it was far too late. So you know, lesson learned in terms of the importance of having a, a seat at the table just on the, the existential level that did exist during COVID. But now we, we have to abstract this to the, the larger vision that exists within our industry. Internally, and I, I've talked about this before many times, um, I recently did a podcast series uh, with Dr. Darian Parker uh, called The Front Lines of Fitness. I'll actually link up to that in the show notes because I think some of you will find it interesting. And I also said it recently on a panel that I sat on in Las Vegas at Idea World to talk about you know, what we need to do to become essential as an industry and basically advance onto the healthcare continuum. And I said, we internally as an industry viewed ourselves very, very differently than what the people outside of our industry viewed us as going into the COVID pandemic. We viewed ourselves as being an essential constituent in the healthcare continuum. 
clearly when we were shut down right away and shut down for a long period of time during the pandemic. And then we were reopened with restaurants and bars and casinos, uh, three things that are clearly not in the healthcare continuum. It, it became abundantly clear to me, as it should have to many of you, that how we viewed ourselves was very, very skewed from how the external world viewed ourselves, particularly lawmakers, public health officials, and the medical community. And this is where the advocacy work, I think, really has to be done in the future. Now, the exciting thing is, is, is it is happening on a, on a high level. There is a lot of advocacy work going on to legitimize and professionalize our industry. A lot of those conversations are very, very high level uh, and a little bit beyond the scope of this podcast right now, because most of you who are listening to this are your frontline fitness professionals, your frontline owner operators. You are the frontline healthcare professionals as far as I'm concerned in this country. And so talking about that really, you know, complex high level policy work is probably not the most impactful and high mileage thing that I could tell you about right now with regard to advocacy and lobbying. But what I can tell you is that if we are going to become part of the healthcare delivery system, if our facilities are going to become considered part of that public health infrastructure that we know they are internally, but externally they're not viewed as that. And if our professionals in the industry, our fitness professionals, those of you that are listening, if you are to truly be considered qualified healthcare providers, just like a physical therapist, a nurse, a doctor, a registered dietitian, if that is going to happen, it is going to happen on a policy level first. This involves healthcare policy, it involves economic policy, it involves the policy that's associated with the regulation of occupations. It is going to happen on that policy level. I mean, nothing happens in this country without politics and policy moving something in one direction or the other. And again, we've just started to mature as an industry and make our way into this space. And Again, there's much high level work that's going on right now, and I suspect there'll be a number of conversations on the wellness paradox in the future and uh, with other groups that I work with that will unpack some of those higher level initiatives. But really what I want to talk to all of you about is you know, what can you do? from an advocacy and a lobbying perspective? And, and why should you do it? And I think I'll start with the why. I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek. Start with why. If you haven't read that book, check it out. But you know, compelling causes start with why. I have a dream, right? Martin Luther King, it, that was his compelling cause. Well, our dream in our industry, and I think it's a dream that we can make a reality, is to become part of the healthcare delivery system. And whenever there's any large movement afoot to make change in an ecosystem or an industry or in society, there are two critical coexisting forces at play. There is the top-down pressure that occurs from the policy level. A lot of these high-level conversations that are happening with uh, groups like the United States Registry of Exercise Professionals and uh, the Physical Activity Alliance and the American College of Sport Medicine, American Council on Exercise, so on and so forth, all these high level policy conversations, and those have to happen. And that exerts downward pressure for change. But there's certainly a much more immediate and a much more powerful pressure that can exist because that, that top down pressure takes time. Um, politics are inherently political and that it's a it's a cumbersome process sometimes glacial in nature in terms of the pace that it moves at but there's also a grassroots level that exists and that is the bottom up groundswell to movements that can make substantive differences on how a cause is viewed how an industry in this case progresses and is viewed as professional and that is something that all of you can be involved in and all of you can be involved in right now. The reality is, and this is largely comes from this, this panel that I was sitting on uh, 
a couple of weeks ago in Las Vegas, where we were talking about the the policy level changes and we we're talking about the the bottom up changes. And you know, I said to the audience, I said, you know, I realize that these high level policy changes seem like they're a long way away. And some of them are, some of them are, are closer than others, but there are things you can go back to your clubs and into your communities and do tomorrow that can make a, an impact on this movement. And they are advocacy and they are lobbying. And th- that's kind of what I want to get to as an action item from this conversation is that you can do things that are advocacy and lobbying in nature. And I'm going to try to start with this actionable part of this discussion from the most basic grassroots level to things that take a little bit more time, effort, and energy. And I think the first thing that this really starts with is when you're advocating, you need to have an audience to advocate to. And with that in mind, the first thing we need to do is start to develop relationships outside of the four walls of our facilities that we're in or outside of our Zoom screens. We need to cultivate relationships, trusted relationships with local political officials, with people in the public health community, and with the medical community. And these relationships that we're cultivating are a form of advocacy because until you have somebody that trusts you enough to give you an audience with them and to give you time with them to talk. Another way to say advocating is just having time to talk to somebody who's an influential decision maker. The only way they're going to give you time is if you know them, they like you, and they trust you. And that just starts by building relationships and in in, in doing so in a way that isn't transactional. And I talk about this a lot. It's you know, developing relationships with the the lawmakers and the political officials, the public health officials and the medical community in a way that enhances their life and brings value to their life. I think so many relationships in this world end up being transactional where you're talking to somebody simply because you want something. And people could sniff out transactionality very, very easy. In fact, now it seems like more so than ever. We have a really good um, I think radar for authenticity uh, and altruism versus transactionality. And I think that, you know, in approaching these people, it's starting to get to know them. You know, who are the key people in your community? Who are the key political individuals? Who are people in public health? Who are some of the key medical professionals in your community? Just starting to develop relationships with them. Uh, that could as be something as simple as just reaching out to those that are members of the facilities that you're in and letting them know who you are and what you're doing and hearing more about what they're doing and asking how you can help them. Again, you will endear yourself to these people significantly if you find out how you can help. But the first step in advocacy is identifying the people that you want to or need to advocate towards and then developing relationships with those individuals that are not transactional. So if I was to give an action item here, it it probably would be to find in your sphere of influence or your ecosystem, one local political official, and and there are many local political officials that could be a city council person, uh, that could be someone in an administrative office in, in your local municipality, doesn't have to be your state representative or something like that. Although if you did have access to that person, that certainly would be a great person. Uh, one local political f- official, one local public health official, and one relatively prominent medical official in your community and start to build a relationship with them where you ask for nothing initially, other than maybe a little bit of their time, maybe you buy them coffee, you buy them lunch, and you find out what their needs are and how you, given your expertise in our field, how you can help. So again, it's not a transactional conversation. It's not, hey, I would like to talk to you about what you can do for me. It's let me talk to you about what I can do for you. And at the same time, let me help you understand a little bit about our industry. And those conversations can be paradigm shifting for these type of individuals, because I can tell you from having conversations with all of those stakeholder groups, with politicians, with public health officials, and with medical officials, they do not perceive our industry the same way 
we do. They still perceive it stuck in the 1980s to a lot of uh, extents. I mean, it's still the grungy gym with the bodybuilders, big muscles and ripped abs. That's what a lot of people think of when they see our industry. It's not the contemporary industry of 2022. And we have to disabuse people of that notion, but that starts by developing relationships. So that's the, the first action item that I would give you. Uh, the second action item I would give you, and again, all of these are obviously to the extent that you're comfortable with, is use your platforms of influence strategically. Uh, many of us are active on social media. Certainly some of the most successful fitness professionals out there use social media platforms to promote their services and to explain their philosophies. But these are also great opportunities to just advocate for our industry and do so in a way that's constructive, that's valuable, and that's professional. Now, I'm not a social media expert, and I can't sit here and tell you exactly what that means to advocate through social media for our industry. But I do think putting good quality content out into the world, out into the, the Facebook ecosystem or whatever social media platform you're on, that's high quality, educated fitness content that is evidence-based. I think that is a way to shine a spotlight on the acumen and the professionalism that exists in our industry. Uh, I also think, you know, making your feelings known about kind of where our industry fits on the healthcare continuum and why it fits there, you know, getting that message out there that we are part of the healthcare delivery system. And I think you know, fundamentally that might be one of the most important things that we can all collectively do from an advocacy perspective is speak with a unified message. Our industry, as are many industries, but ours because it's a little more immature um, just in terms of you know, time of existence, uh, it, it tends to be very fragmented in its messaging. And when lawmakers, public health officials, and the medical community are hearing 15 different messages, the reality is, is that you know 15 different messages is the same as no message to those individuals. It's just too fragmented. It's too muted and it's not focused enough. And so us all talking from this perspective of the importance of our industry, not for the sake of the industry per se, but for the sake of public and population health and advocating through social media for that I think that's very impactful when it's done at a high enough volume and at a great enough frequency. And then I think the other thing I have to say about the, the social media piece is we have to be very, very aware and cognizant of what we post and what we're doing when we post. I think that some of us in our industry, and I'm hesitating because I, I want to use my words carefully here. I think that some of us in our industry talk out of one side of our mouth that we want to be considered part of healthcare. But then on the other side of our mouth, we, we do and we say things that are inconsistent with that. And I, I kind of liken it to this. You're never going to see a physical therapist, or at least for the most part, you're probably not going to see a physical therapist take their shirt off and pose with their abs and their biceps out on social media. Yet we see that a lot in our industry. Um, you're probably never going to see a physical therapist work in a tank top and cut off shorts or something like that. But you see that a lot in our industry. And so if we want to be treated like healthcare professionals, if we want to be part of that healthcare continuum, the things that we post, the things that we do on social media, the outward perception that we portray for the public and in the public are the lawmakers, the public health officials and the medical community. In addition to all of our prospective clients is that image has to be one of healthcare. So again, I'm not necessarily ever interested in telling something, someone specifically how to do something. And this is just me kind of more unpacking the more overarching concept of, of online uh, advocacy work. And then you know, the last thing I'll, I'll talk about here as I start to bring this conversation to a close is just the, the role of getting involved on a higher level and how one, impactful that can be, and, and two, how needed it is at this point. And you know, if you're listening to this and you are inspired by the idea of 
more formal advocacy work. That what I just told you about in terms of relationship building and advocating through social media, I'd consider that informal advocacy work. But there certainly are opportunities for formal advocacy that exist. And as the industry becomes more structured and organized around advocacy, these opportunities are going to proliferate more and more and more. And the two opportunities I would like to point out to everyone, first and foremost, is to be involved with your state alliance. I realize that the people that listen to this podcast are outside of the state of Michigan, in addition to being inside the state. And yes, we have a robust state alliance here in Michigan, and uh, they do some phenomenal, phenomenal work. It's a great group of individuals. But in many other states, and I've met a number of these people, there are state alliances that are doing you know, equally as important and robust work in their political ecosystems. Join your state alliances, uh, be involved, be part of the conversation. In many cases, these are you know low or no cost opportunities to be part of a larger group that is advocating on your behalf to the decision makers if you're not so inclined to actually be in the room to have those conversations. Uh, we absolutely need a seat at the table and a voice in the room. You don't have to have that seat at the table and you don't have to have your voice in the room, but we collectively as an industry do. And a lot of the decisions that impact our industry are made at the state and the local level, even more so than the federal level. So being a part of your state alliance, one, to support them to whatever degree you can financially is important. I mean, the reality is, is we all have lobbying firms. We all have expenses as associations and, and those expenses require money to subsidize the cost of the organization. But more importantly, more important than the money, even if the money is not something that's tenable for you right now, which I would completely understand coming out of the pandemic, is being aligned with that organization and being another member, another constituent of that unified voice for your industry in the state is so critical. Because again, the more fragmented our messages are, the more groups that represent our, our interests, the more complex it is for the decision makers to align the critical interests in our industry with the conversations that are happening. So get involved with your state alliance. I'll put a link on the show notes page as to how you can find out more about contacting your state alliance, or in some cases, some states don't have an alliance as of yet, which means if you're so inclined, you or your colleagues could potentially start one. The other thing that I'll mention is the opportunity to become a part of something called Team 435. Uh, you heard me mention this briefly uh, in episode 62, the URSA recap episode, and I, I got a couple questions on it, so I wanted to touch on it again. This is a very, what I'll call formal advocacy opportunity. Uh, Team 435, uh, which is headed up by URSA and then the NHFA, the National uh, Fitness and Health Alliance, uh, which is the lobbying arm of URSA, uh, they envision this very, very robust and extensive framework for having contact, direct contact in all 435 congressional districts in the country, where they would have a team of people, 435 people embedded in each congressional district that would be receiving monthly information that they can send to their congressional representative, uh, bear in mind this is on the federal level, your, your federal congressional representative, about what's happening in our industry. Again, it, it's building value and having conversation and having a relationship before we actually need something from that individual. Uh, the exciting thing about Team 435 is that a little bit of time and a little involvement is all that's necessary on your part to make this a reality. Uh, URSA and the NHFA do really all of the heavy lifting for you in terms of putting together the content. Ultimately, you do need to do some reaching out to your local political officials, certainly your local congressional office, but that's even a framework that they've put in place for you. So the, the very elemental components of lobbying and advocating on a more formal level definitely exists for our industry. And I want to bring this conversation to a close with this simple point. If we are going to become part of the healthcare continuum, it just can't be you know, 10, 15, 20 people working on the policy level to make that a reality. It also has to be thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of fitness professionals, 
facility owners, operators, and other stakeholders that engage with our industry that are advocating from that grassroots level. The reality is what we've saw recently here in Michigan is a relatively small team of people, um, less than 10 of us on the Michigan Fitness Club Association board, was able to secure eight and a half million dollars in the state budget because of our advocacy and our lobbying work. And that is tangible proof that you can indeed make a difference. So this is my advocacy to you and my plea to you to get involved because we need you if we are going to move on to the healthcare continuum. The objective reality is you can make a difference. We just need you to be willing to step up to the plate and make that difference like so many other people are doing right now in our industry. There's tremendous opportunity for us right now, but with that tremendous opportunity comes tremendous responsibility. And I certainly think the listeners of this podcast are willing to take on that responsibility to help move our industry onto the healthcare continuum. Thank you for your time in this episode. Any additional information that I'd like to share will be found in the show notes page. It's wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode six, five. Please be on the lookout for next week's episode when it drops on Wednesday. And don't forget to subscribe through your favorite podcast platform. Until we chat again next week, please be well.